five minutes or again the cash bar is open for about five more minutes thanks I see many of our VIP guests drinking wine. Uh, I encourage that activity, and I even tell you that there's a wonderful Cabernet, a wonderful Merlot, even a Pinot Noir at the bar. So welcome.
Ladies and gentlemen, give a warm White Bear Lake and first Tuesday conservative welcome to Alpha News reporter and host of the wildly popular show called Live with Kyle Hooten, our very own conservative boy wonder, able to topple large piles of liberal spin with a single bound, it's Kyle Hooten! Thank you so much, everybody. That's the best introduction I've ever received to this point, so I'm very grateful for that. And it's quite the intro for the guy who's just introducing Altman. That's what I'm really here to do. Uh, right off the bat, we really appreciate you all coming out tonight. It means so much to uh, Altman and the viewers of the live stream, which is being broadcast right now, hosted exclusively by Alpha News. And um, I just want to take a moment and highlight some of the people we have here with us tonight. I know that we have people who have come all the way from the Pacific Northwest in Washington. We have people who have joined us all the way from Dallas. We have viewers all over the world who are watching this broadcast right now. We have Congressman Steve King with us from Iowa. We have uh, Michael Hitchborn of the Lepanto Institute and And we have Jim Hale reporting on this event for LifeSite News. So we're very grateful to all of you who have joined us today. A couple logistics things that I've been tasked with covering. Um, you should all have note cards if you want to submit a question to Father Altman. If you don't have note cards, I think you can acquire them right over there. If you have a question for Altman uh, while he's speaking, write your question on the note card, pass it like the offering basket to one of the ushers who will pick it up, and uh, that's how you can ask Father Altman a question. Um, now I just want to say a few things to introduce Altman. Uh, when I first met him, he was the, the COVID Catholic. Uh, as you might all remember, Last year, we had all these orders coming down from very high places that sought to separate the faithful uh, from their churches. And Altman was one of the few people to speak out against what he called an atrocity at that time. Uh, he spoke out clearly, he spoke out confidently, and he captured media attention in doing so, as well as our appreciation. He reminded us that the saints of old dined with lepers, and he said that religious leaders of today should also dine with the sick, commune with the sick, and open the doors of the church so the faithful can receive Eucharist during the stressful time that the COVID pandemic was. During our very first interview together, Father Altman explained to me that he did not fear the coronavirus because he knew that his duty to God and to his flock were more important than his own health or even his life, and I truly believe that he meant that. Father Altman is fairly unique in his understanding and emphasis on the sacrifices that built the church to its present form. And hearing this for the first time was a very powerful moment that drove home for me just what a holy and impactful man Father Altman is. As time went on, we witnessed a shift in his message. Although he entered the public consciousness as a COVID policy critic, our understanding of what he really has to say has evolved. I believe that the reason people gravitated towards him last year is not because they disliked COVID policy, although that's surely true, but it's because they hungered for truth and because Father Altman provides the ultimate truth, that which can only be found in Jesus Christ. After coming under fire from certain elements of church leadership, he has called to our attention deficits in those who occupy important offices. But inside his scathing admonishment of those who dilute and distort the faith is a core of love. Father Altman, in my estimation, is not motivated by ire or spite or a desire for attention, as some detractors might suggest. Rather, he is one of the few truly principled people I have ever had the honor of meeting. He is motivated by a deep desire to spread truth and to be an instrument of the Lord at any cost. I'm sure you're all aware of the struggles he currently faces with regards to certain church leaders, and I know that many of you have even donated as he faces potential canonical penalties following his refusal to abandon his flock. We live in a society that uplifts and celebrates the most deranged and perverted idols. And against this backdrop of corruption and degeneracy, there are good people like Father Altman who dare to speak out and hold their head high amidst all manners of controversy. I, like many of you, have immense respect for those who will stand tall as the rest of the world buckles. Like you all, 
I feel we have found a unique mouthpiece for truth in Altman, and I'm proud to introduce him to you all tonight. But before we do that, I just want to say that I did not realize until very recently just how busy Father Altman is. Last time we hosted him on the Alpha News live stream show, which many of you watch, and it's been quite the honor to meet you. Really appreciate that. Uh, but last time we hosted him on the show, he came from one meeting, did our show, stayed overnight in the Minneapolis area, woke up at 6 in the morning the next day to go pray and commune with the faithful. I don't recall the exact logistics of how this all worked out, but suffice it to say, he's a very busy man. And these are not all glamorous events. He truly believes in meeting with the faithful and encouraging them in their struggles. Nearly every time I've spoken with Father Altman, he's told me about responding to the letters people send him, and he's received literally thousands of letters. He tells me how he feels strongly compelled to provide meaningful responses to those who come to him seeking advice, guidance, and encouragement. And this is the man that Father Altman is. He's one to wake up early, go to bed late, and spend every moment in between doing the Lord's work with no ego or attitude. He's become a voice for those who feel betrayed by certain elements within an institution, but through it all, has retained the character of a genuine, humble, small-town priest. And it is for these reasons that I'm most proud to introduce to you all Father Altman. I'm glad to have the opportunity to greet all of you as you support Father Altman. As hopefully you're aware, I support him because he's bold enough to speak the truth of Jesus Christ, to defend the deposit of faith, as every priest should. I'm sure Father Altman and I have different opinions on lots of ideas and lots of different issues that we face, but it's not a matter of opinion when it comes to priests of the church that Jesus Christ established, his bride, the Catholic Church. We teach what the church teaches, and there are too many voices that want to not represent that and not speak up in the ways that we really have to. So I'm here thanking Father Altman and supporting him for speaking the truth of Jesus Christ in his holy bride, the church. This is John Henry Weston. On behalf of all of us here at LifeSightNews.com, I wanted to thank you for coming out to support Father James Altman, a man of great faith who took on the role of shepherd of our souls in these perilous times. He has spoken out where so many others have remained silent. He has confronted the wolves in sheep's clothing because he's a true shepherd of souls. And out of love for us and for our children, he has put on the mantle of Christ in the temple, chasing out those hungry for money and willing to devour the sheep. He has done so knowing the cost, knowing the punishment that is meted out by the enemies of Christ in his church, even those masquerading as bishops in the church and those too cowardly to stand up against them. So we, the faithful, must stand up to defend Father Altman, our faithful shepherd, this beloved priest who in persona Christi has ministered to all of us by his courage, by his example, and by his fierce love. We love you, Father Altman, and we are ready to fight for you. My name is Jesse Romero, Catholic lay evangelist, retired Los Angeles deputy sheriff. I want to thank Father James Altman. I appreciate the fact that he speaks the truth. I think all of us have an appreciation for the truth. And I appreciate that he has the courage to stand up against all these forces that are seeking to silence him. And I wish there was a lot more Catholic priests like him that had his apostolic zeal and apostolic courage. All of us lay people, let's get behind priests like this. Pray for them, do penance for them, fast for them, encourage them, write letters to them, support them. Father James Altman's his uh, messages have emboldened other priests around the world to preach the truth. And there's countless lay people that have commented on social media 
that they're starving to be fed with the truth just like Father James Altman preaches. And it's very sad when uh, bishops are promoting the lies of uh, people like Father James Martin, but they're seeking to cancel priests like Father Altman. Father Altman and all you good holy priests out there, stay close to the authentic teaching of the church. Stay under Our Lady's mantle with the rosary. Stay close to the sacred heart of our blessed Lord in the tabernacle. And uh, may God bless you and give you long life and uh, send many people to your ranks. Viva Cristo Rey! This is Liz Yor. I wanted to share my unwavering support for Father Altman, this happy warrior for Christ. At a time when precious few speak truth to power, Father Altman has stepped into the breach and done so fearlessly. In fact, not since Fulton Sheen have we had a priest whose fearless witness to the truth resonated throughout America. Father Altman has taken up his cross and I am reminded of the powerful words of the beloved priest, Father John Harden, who said that every vocation is born of sacrifice, is maintained by sacrifice, and is measured in the apostolate by the sacrifice of those whom God calls to the priesthood. In fact, Father Harden also added, the more intimate one's vocation to the service of Christ, the more demanding will be the sacrifices required. So here we are, we're witnessing the sacrifice thrust upon Father Altman. Now it is we, the laity, who must take up our own cross and fight for him and the other many good and holy priests who are enduring persecution from the most curious and troubling places. Thank you, Father Altman. Thank you for converting the nation by bellowing the truth from your pulpit and loving the mystical body of Christ. Hello everyone, Michael Voris here. We here at Church Middleton are happy to add our voice to the many standing in support of Father James Altman as well as all the other priests he represents, the aborted priests of the USCCB. Father Altman and they are having their vocations threatened by a corrupt leadership, literally hell-bent on denying the faith and denying the faith being authentically communicated to future generations. Father Altman and his fellow brave clergy are standing in the way of this evil, putting themselves out there on the front lines taking a vicious beating by hireling shepherds, and they need your support. Wicked and complicit bishops are truly attempting to abort their priesthoods, and in these men who have and are now sacrificing everything for the integrity of the one true faith, they need every ounce of support we can give them, spiritual and material. We need to support him and all priests. We need to encourage them to rise up against this Episcopal tyranny they are fighting for their vocations and for your salvation. It is unconscionable that Father Altman and these other men would be treated this way when the likes of James Martin is not only given a pass, but actually celebrated and receives endorsements from these corrupt leaders. It's time to rise up and strike back in the name of the Catholic faith. God love you. Greta Marie thanks you, and just so you know, this is why I do anything, oh. right here. Oh, please be seated. So I'd like to meet this person Kyle keeps talking about. <laughs> oh. Oh my goodness. Dear family, uh, like the joke goes, if it, if it wasn't for the last minute, I'd never get anything done. And these, uh, the cassock just came back from the cleaners today. I was a little worried about that. Otherwise, I'd look like a Colum you remember Columbo after a <laughs> crime investigation scene. 
My mother even uh, ironed my cuffs. She wouldn't let me get out the door without them. The books, the books arrived. They arrived, I had to go get them at Walgreens because FedEx wasn't going to deliver them. And then I couldn't find my keys. <sighs> it's very stressful. Very bad thoughts were going through my mind. <laughs> and, oh, I had to do I had to pray to St. Anthony. I, I prefer to be able to accomplish things on my own, but I stopped in the hallway and said, St. Anthony. And lo and behold, I walked into my bedroom, and there on my chest of drawers, where I had looked twice before, were my keys. <laughs> so I thought, okay, good. I hopped in the car, started driving north, and then I started having these really good ideas to share with you. So I looked over to the right. I was going to, got a pen. I was going to write down some notes, and that's when I realized that I had left my talk behind. <laughs> so, so I'm feeling a little bit like Adam and Eve must have felt when they were exposed in the garden. <laughs> oh, goodness. That's why it's always a good thing to pray. Let us pray. In nomine Patris et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Heavenly Father, send your spirit down upon us like the dewfall. Fill us with the grace we need to be witnesses of our faith unto martyrdom. Let us be a light of Christ to this ever-darkening world. And we ask this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Somebody was saying, too, when they were looking at my notes here, that, oh, you have really good writing. And I thought, well, okay, you're about to find out. It's, I, can't, I can't read it, and I wrote it. <laughs> Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, comes to our assistance when we're in time of need. That's why we pray. There was this, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I, this guy, I think his name was Andre Crouch. He was a praise and worship guy from the 70s. And he had this beautiful hymn that he wrote. And he said, so I thank God for the mountains. And I thank him for the valleys. And I thank him for all the storms he brought me through. For if I never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in his word can do. Well, there it is. I mean, that applies to each and every one of us not just me, it applies in spades to all those other priests that uh, you may have seen on Church Militant. It applies. The reason I'm here, I hope you know this, is not because of me. It's because of all those other priests that are being picked on and have been picked on way more than me. I, I can't hold a candle to them. There I was amidst those, well, there were nine of us, so there were eight other priests. Father Perone was there. Priest for life. Then you're on, if you're listening, I'm coming for you. <laughs> what he has allowed his chancery to do to that holy, holy man, inexcusable. And, and it's continuing. It's just continuing. So, tyranny. Some of the testimonies were so heart rendering. I don't know if you, those of you saw it know that right next to me was a, a beautiful priest from Poland. Been there. It's Holy, very Catholic over there. And I think it was in Buffalo he went to, and he was abused. And what did he do? What could he do? He knew God called him. God allows evil. And in the end, he understands this. God allows evil so that we can overcome it. For the, the you know, the mountains, the valleys, the storms he brought us through. He brought has brought that priest through it. But it's time we say enough is enough. There isn't manner and tone enough in my body to, descri <laughs> to describe <clears throat> what's coming their way if Bishop Callahan sidelines me next week. Because, dear family, all glory be to God. Unlike those other suffering souls, I know how to defend myself. But more importantly, I know how to defend them, and I will. <laughs> So, so please understand um, one key thing, that it's thanks to you that I even can go forward no matter what. Not so much at all defending me, but as I said, compared to them, they are holy and persecuted. Um, I said to them, well, I'm the worst sinner in the house, and I mean it. And, uh, but their animo the animosity of their tyrants does not phase me. God only knows why. However, he raised me up. However, he built me up to who I am today. But thanks to you, I can go forward with 
defending them, speaking up for them, sheltering and protecting them, these holy priests who are trying to bring you grace, unlike so many bishops in the last 15 months. They have gifts of holiness I'll never have, but I, I do have one thing that they don't have, a very big mouth. <laughs> <clears throat> When I was, when I was, when I was a little boy, my mother used to say, "You should just go be a lawyer." And at the time, I thought, "No," but yeah, I guess it it worked out for the well for the better. But everything I'm about to tell you, I guess, even though it applies, I guess, to me personally, I'm not trying to cry the blues or I'm not looking for sympathy. Um, I like to say, oh, "I'm I'm a man. I can take care of myself." They and they know that to their dismay. Um, but why, what I'm going to say is so for the purpose of you understanding what has happened to me has been happening to them now for decades. Do you know what? They probably don't like me to say this, but there was a change in the ordination of a bishop back in uh, after Vatican II. And it went from being an ordination, a consecration to the fullness of the priesthood to being an ordination of like an executor. I don't have the precise word, but it went from being one of us, but with this great grace, the fullness, to being a tyrant. And, and we've seen how that has played out since Vatican II. Uh, and you can look at the Vatican II documents, this is an aside, you can look at the Vatican, people say, well, there's nothing wrong with the Vatican II documents. Well, first of all, Nostra Aetate, bad news, bad. And I think it's 15 through 18 right in, uh, at Lumen Gentium, there's some sketchy stuff in there that leaves it so broad, so ambiguous, it's open for interpretation. It's open so that Bishop Barron can say, well, Jesus is just the privileged way. No, Bishop Barron, you have it wrong. Jesus is the way, the only way, and if you're not going to say it, get out of the Catholic Church, Bishop Barron. <clears throat> See, I do, I do have a big mouth. <laughs> do you know, I love the guy. He was one of my priest professors. He was amazing. But here's the problem. If you haven't heard me talk, anybody here heard me talk about rat poison? Or who hasn't heard me talk about rat poison? You've all heard, you pretty much all have heard. Yes, it's rat poison. When you can stand there as a, in a bishop's collar and a bishop's cross and, and say, Jesus is the privileged way. Those words should never come out of any Catholic's mouth. Priest or no priest. Bishop or no bishop. That's just frightening. Well, anyway, so... Uh, Here's a couple things. Um, when I was in seminary, I, I have said this before, uh, there was a great deal of bad actors in seminary. In, not so much in the seminarians. I, in the entire time I was in there, I never saw anything that gave rise to suspicion of, of misconduct. But uh, some of the formators, priests, were, how can I say this politely? There's a baby in the room. Uh, <laughs> they just weren't suited for the task. And uh, my spiritual director said to me, I know what you're thinking, Jim. If that's what it means, if that's the example, if you think that's what it means to be a priest, you don't want any part of it. But understand, that is not what it means to be a priest. And, you know, uh, you get, what is it, one bad, one good, good thing for every five bad things. The, the, the ratio is like five to one. Uh, and um, so uh, when I was struggling with this issue in seminary, um, a beautiful, powerful, holy, he was a Jesuit, one of the few good ones. Um, you know, sad to say that's actually true, and, and they know it. Uh, said to me, when I said, I'm, I'm really angry, and I don't know that I can continue if our Father in Heaven doesn't fix this. Right now, I'm leaving. And um, he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make it, get out a notepad, like those, like a legal pad, draw a line down the middle. And on this side, I want you to write down the names of those Priests, you think, have hurt you, have made your life a living hell, whatever. Uh, but then, then when you get done with that, do that list first. Then go on this side and start writing down those who have been, those priests and those people in your life that have been a powerful, profound, holy influence on, on you, showed you love. So I thought, okay, I can do this. So I did. I, I got out the, I'm very obedient. Uh, <laughs> I made the line. I started out here and I had the five or six people that made my life a living hell. OK. 
okay, I vented. That was a venting thing. Then I went over here on this side and I started writing down the names of those people that God puts in every one of our lives that, that show us what love is. And I got all the way down the page and I wasn't done. So I, I, had, I, had, to, I had to turn it like this and, and write down on here. And then I still wasn't done. I had to turn it upside down and write down some on here. And then I set it down in front of me. And I looked at the short list. And I looked at this wonderful list. And I thank God for the good people in my life. The people that inspired me to love the, the baby. I mean, what, what, what profound glory. You have no idea. I wanted 13. You know this. So I, to be able to hold her back there for a little while and to show her to, yeah. Greta Marie, I think she'll probably have special prayers throughout my priesthood. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in seminary we go through a lot. In, in the priesthood, just before we graduated, that we had a bunch of priests a, uh, like a group that had been ordained one to ten years come into our graduating class. There was 56 of us. We were the biggest class of Mundelein for many decades be, since and, and ever since then too, I think. And they'd been ordained one to ten years and they wanted to tell us, and this is what they told us, that so, at some point in the first ten years, you're going to want to leave the priesthood. It's going to happen to you. Don't pretend otherwise. Some that might happen in year three, four, five, seven, maybe year ten. It's going to happen. You're just going to want to leave. Throw in the towel. Say, I've had it. And this came from priests that I actually knew. I was shocked because they were so holy. I, could, I, I was shocked. I would never have guessed. But there you have it. It's true. So what I'm going to tell you now is the reason why priests want to leave but also the reason why we stay. Parishioners. Every parish seems to have a certain number, usually small, of parishioners. That it doesn't matter how much work we do, and it's a lot. It, in, in seminary, they said, well, the priest is the only job where there's not really uh, somebody watching over your shoulders. You can do as little or as much as you're inclined to do. Uh, my parents raised me. They grew up in the Depression, so they raised me to work a lot. So I do. Uh, but it doesn't matter how much work you do. Now, keep in mind, this applies to all priests. I'm not just, this is not just me. It doesn't matter how much we've sacrificed. No matter what, there are just some prisoners who are just plain mean and dissatisfied. <laughs> You may have heard of uh, you, know, you may have heard of one of my former St. James parishioners, who, along with her, I'll say it this way because it's kind of true, her little coven. Um, <laughs> that sounds like a much better word than another one I could choose. <laughs> There's like eight of them that go over to the cathedral now. They've left St. James and they brag about the fact that they've left St. James and they are trying to get other people to join them in leaving St. James because they just can't stand me. And uh, one even, I don't know how AP does this, but the left-wing media, the Marxist media, seems to be able to find, to track down these people, the disgruntled, dissatisfied. So the, she was in the story. So they'll present one good side and one bad side. doesn't matter that the good are like 80 or 90%, the bad are small, they'll just show it one-on-one, -on -one, so it's like equal weight. They're so deceptive in the way that they present their stories. And she was in there saying this exact same complaint that I had heard before, that I somehow called her Nancy instead of by her real name. <laughs> For whatever reason, I was really shy as a kid. I still am. You know, I don't like being up here. <laughs> I was, you know, when the Christmas, maybe you heard me say this, when the Christmas crash is there in the, in the sanctuary, my chair where I sit is tucked in behind it. And I think, oh, nobody can look at me. And then all of a sudden, it goes away at the end of Advent season and they can see me again. It's very uncomfortable for me. <laughs> So I, when I was a kid, I would never look at, I would never, people would introduce themselves to me and I'd be looking down. I would never look in their face. So I would not remember their, I didn't develop that skill of remembering names or faces. So if I ever see you again, please do me a favor and just say, I am so-and-so when I met you here. That would be a big help to our conversation. <laughs> well, so, and, and here's the best example I can use of this. Um, in my former parish where I was for nine years before I got transferred to St. James and La Crosse, a decision Bishop regrets to this day, I'm sure. 
I said, I didn't want to go. He asked. It was a request. I said, okay. I could have said no. It's not being disobedient. So you're clear on this. When a bishop requests that you do something, it is not being disobedient to say no. If he commands and you say no, that's a whole different story. But a request is something that you can agree to or say yes or say no. Uh, well, I said yes. I was being uh, good, uh, as I thought I should be. So I, uh, I see, I get lost in my stories now. So I went off on this obedience business. Because so I was talking about St. Peter and Paul. Oh, and now, now I know what it was. Yes. <laughs> Faces and recognition. There are two women at St. Peter and Paul that to me looked exactly like my mother. Now, who can mistake your mother, right? So I'd be, I'd be distributing Holy Communion. Oh, wait a minute. You're not my mom. There were two women that looked identical to her. So, so this, this complainer um, was mad because I called her by the name of another woman that she looks a lot like, at least in my eyes. And that was all it took. That's, you see, it doesn't matter how much I do, how much I sacrifice. And, this goes, and I'm saying this not because of me. It goes to all the priests that they face the same thing except worse than I've ever faced, the parishioners. Sometimes are the reasons why we just say, that's just not worth it. But the reason we stay, dear family, is because of prisoners like you. To, to love you, to be a father to you, I, I'm sure you, most of you have heard me say it. I don't know how any father could not feed his children or anoint their dying child. How, how can you be a pastor? How can you be a bishop? How can you be a, how can you, how can you not feed your children? Okay, it's not courage that gets me out of bed in the morning. It's love for my family. What, what, who don't they love? They, they've, I've asked that question any number of times. I have yet to hear one of them answer. They don't love. It, what is love? What is the greatest love? Lay down your life for another. So what if we get sick? At the end of every Mass at St. Saint James, I almost said Peter and Paul, the, at the end of every Mass, we invoke saints. We have a litany of saints. We pray the Memorari. We pray the St. Michael prayer. But you know, Bishop asks that everybody say the St. Michael prayer at the end of Masses, right? Some priests wouldn't. Because how can you not? God, listen, I want him on my side. You know he's over my right shoulder. Do you, you remember, do you see that? So I don't know if you know this. I got that. I actually personally got that in the cave of St. Michael over in Italy, where it's the only altar that has never been consecrated by a bishop because St. Michael consecrated it way back in, I don't know, the year 300. I had to buy a suitcase over there, pack it up with my dirty clothes. So, to pack all around it. So we came back in one piece. Um, why wouldn't you pray to St. Michael? Ask for his intercession. It's Ephesians 6.11. Defend us against the insidious snares of the devil, the insidious diaboli. Why wouldn't you pray that? So we get done praying those two prayers, and then we have a litany of saints. And the litany of saints includes St. Uh, Charles Borromeo. Now, if you know the story, Charles Borromeo, Cardinal Archbishop of Milan, back in the uh, plague days, the bubonic plague, something that was truly contagious, something that would kill you. You'd wake up in the morning, you'd have a black spot, you'd be dead by nightfall. He would go out and he would anoint people, anoint the dying, and he would give them viaticum. How about that for communion on the tongue, you loser bishops? So, you know, I don't know if you know this. I, where was I? Give me, remind me, get me back to Charles Borromeo when I get done with this story. <laughs> you know, I get upset and then I forget the story I'm going to. Um, what was it? I was talking about Charles Borromeo and Viaticum and giving communion on the tongue. Oh, I know what it is. Yes. I knew I'd work my way back to it. The kids in high school, I'd tell them it's like hitting that reverse button on the computer, like where you go back page after page to get back where you are. Um, so, do you remember, I mean, have you heard me tell the story about my mother licking her palms? Have you heard that story? Well, for those of you who haven't, because it's, it's deeply impactful. Um, I'm walking up behind my mother. Your parents, you have such a, just by what you do, teaches your kids. You won't say words, you won't even know your, 
you're teaching them. I'm not going to be behind my mother at Holy Communion. This is back in the craziest of all days. Of course, they removed the communion rail. God forbid we show reverence for the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior. Um, they removed the communion rail, so we had to do the two lines, grab and go. You know, French fries at the McDonald's window. Just grab and go. The irreverence is staggering. I just heard a yet another story of someone walking out. They had to go. Some kid had the communion, Holy Communion, and they had to chase him down. The if you put it on the tongue, there's no. There, we know what's going to happen. That will be consumed, no doubts. When I'm walking up behind my mother, and 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 if you would see, if you could see the way, she knew she was receiving Jesus. She would have preferred not to receive him that way, but there was no choice back then, right? So she received him. And I, I'm watching this. She, she, she takes him and consumes him, and then she licks the palm of her hand. Now, she doesn't know I'm watching. She doesn't know anybody's watching. She's so in the moment of receiving the Lord who loves her and who she loves. She wanted to make sure there was no sacrilege committed against his body blood if there were particles in your hand. And there are. Every single time you receive the Holy Eucharist in your hand, bishops of America, are you listening? There are particles in their hands. How dare you allow that sacrilege to continue? It's an abomination. They don't like it when I hear that. You know who started that old business? Cardinal Bernadine. And you know what? I've heard from several sources, like Church Militant and the like, Several priests, that guy was doing satanic stuff in Rome. Do you know how it all happened, how we got communion in the hand? He was president of the USCCB, I think after Dearden, who started that call to action, apostasy. And, uh, and for three straight years, the USCCB at this meeting like they're having right now, voted it down. And he was out because after three years, it goes to the next guy. So what he did was he did what happened in 2020 election. He... He stuffed the ballot box. He went and he called a whole bunch of retired bishops who weren't supposed to be voting anyway. And then he called a couple bunch of bishops who weren't even there to get, you know, it's, it's a ballot harvesting. And then he says, well, I've got enough votes. We're now going to have communion in the hand. It was a lie. I have no doubt. I have no doubt in my mind where he is now. None, zero. Look, did he repent? Ask yourself a simple question. If you sin and you know you've caused others to sin and you're getting close to death aren't you going to think well I'm going to meet my maker soon I better make reparation that's what a Catholic does now they say oh Hitler didn't repent or Hitler might have repented like as if there's time between the time he pulls the trigger and he dies to say a first examination of conscience right did he have time for an examination of conscience? No, he was too busy thinking about this and doing away with Ava Braun. Father, forgive me for I've sinned. I know I haven't always been a good Catholic. I, th I think he was. Was, past tense. Um, those gas chambers, probably a bad idea. I'm so sorry. Did that happen? No, listen. Did he repent? Did, if he repented, he would have done something other than killing himself in order to make sure that all those people he led astray would have, would have uh, realized the error he didn't. Uh, St. Charles, or St. Uh, John Vianney, patron saint of parish priests and confessors, says deathbed conversions are rare. There's not much time for a deathbed conversion, is there? It's very Mormon to think, well, after you die, then you still get to choose. That, they do believe that. Uh, no, that's not the teaching of the church, which is just Jesus' teaching handed down to us faithfully, unchanged and unchangeable. Okay, so where was I? Because I really got off track. I was talking about my mother in communion, licking the palm of her hands, and then Bernadine instituting communion in the hand, which is an abomination, and there are particles in your hand. So here's what, here's what I say. Okay, if you insist on receiving communion in your hand, when you get done, I want to see you lick your palm. Right? And this is what people are going to say. That's disgusting. There's germs. My palms are dirty. Look what I've touched. Well, if that's the case, then why are you putting Jesus in the palm of your hand? If you can't lick the palm of your hand because of some reason, then you shouldn't be putting Jesus there either. So, uh, yeah, I know, amen. Um, I was going to say one more thing about that. Well, it's a, it's a huge topic. 
Because if you don't believe in Jesus, you don't believe in the Catholic Church, you don't believe in the Savior that said, you have to eat my body and drink my blood, faith goes out the window. You see what they've done? Just here's this. So, so I often wondered about this. Like, you know, the Protestant playbook was 500 years ago. They wanted to destroy belief in the real presence, Luther et al. So they said, how are we going to do this? I know, communion in the hand. And it really relates to this, my mother licking her palm. 500 years ago, we did not have nice running water, indoor plumbing. My parents didn't even have that when they were growing up in the Depression. They had outhouses. And uh, no 26 different flavors of soap in the soap aisle at the, at the supermarket. No nice hygiene. You had agrarian people, mostly illiterate, going out farming, working with the dirt, working with the animals. And they came into church to receive Holy Communion from the consecrated and clean hands of the priest. Remember, he has washed his hands up at the altar. We still do. Holds out their hands. What do those hands look like 500 years ago? Pretty dirty. I wouldn't, I wouldn't lick my palm 500 years ago. <laughs> you, put, you put something in your hands, the sacred, the eternally sacred. The real presence, the source and summit of all our grace. Well, that's not something special. I can put it in my dirty, filthy hands. See how diabolical was the Protestant playbook 500 years ago. You see how diabolical Dearden was, or, um, or uh, Bernadine was, when he stuffed that down our throat with a little election fraud, which it was in, uh, I think it was 1976. So, uh, all right, so now we're done with that. What did I want to go back to? Charles Borromeo. <laughs> It all came because he's, he's distributing communion on the tongue. He didn't say, oh, you got the plague. Here, hold out your hand. I'm just going to drop it in there and you feed yourself. That's not what he did. So the apocryphal story, the most apocryphal story, is back then, there, actually Monty Python made a funny movie about this, where they say, bring out your dead. Remember that? They were chanting at the monks and they would throw the bodies in and some guy says, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> and I, Don't they beat him with a board or something like that? Well, so that's, but that's what they did back then with the bubonic plague victims. They, they understood this much that if they just burned the bodies, it would be less likely to spread. So Charles Borromeo is coming through town, and he comes upon a pile of corpses. The guy at the top isn't yet dead. So he climbs up those corpses, and he anoints. Remember, they were so afraid to anoint. They were, at, what was it, at, at Ash Wednesday, they were using, like, Q-tips and stuff. Oh, listen, come to St. James as long as I'm there. It's thumb and it's ashes. And remember, man, that thou art dust. That's what you're going to get. Blessed ashes. So Charles Borromeo climbs up and he anoints them with holy oil. He touches them. There's such healing and touching. And then he gives them viaticum. So who's the first person that Charles Borromeo met when he got to the heavenly gates? That guy. He's there. And he said, thank you. How dare any bishop in this country, how dare they around the globe, how dare they deny the priest the right to anoint the dying, their own children, how dare you? You're no father of the Catholic Church. Get out. That's, well, that's why they don't like me. <laughs> It's easy enough, Bishop. Here's all, here's all you need to do. Get on one of these live streams and get down on your knees and you apologize to each and every one of us for failing as a shepherd, for abandoning your flock. And until you do, the faithful Catholics have had it with you. So people often ask me, well, what do we do? How, what can we do? So now, now, is, now they're really going to hate me. Because so, <laughs> I'm going to tell you what you do. Well, first of all, you vote with your feet in your pocketbook. You find a pastor who loves you, who will die for you, who will feed you. Find him and then just go to him. It might be a long trek. We, we have a guy up for canonization in my uh, diocese, Father Joe Walieski, who for 50 years worked at this uh, orphanage down in Peru. And um, he uh, was, <laughs> I had the, the privilege, 
That, by the way, the closest I ever came to death when I was letting him drive. <laughs> He couldn't see very well, and it was nighttime, and we're on this busy traffic, and I'm trying, he's, you know, he's kind of wavering. I'm saying, okay, let me drive now, let me drive. So he pulled off, you know, those, their exits, they're like, you know, like a butter, what's that called, clover leaf? <laughs> and there was a lot of construction orange barrels around, so he couldn't even get off the road. So he, he, he gets off this exit, and he stops right in the middle of the thing. <laughs> yeah. Cars now, they don't know we're stopped because they can't see. They're whipping around like, hey, listen, he's a saint because I'm still alive. <laughs> But he, he would describe these stories of how people actually made the effort to get to Holy Mass. And um, one in particular I'll never forget because I think it was an alligator got her, a mother. And she knew how important it was to get to Mass. What about for so many Catholics in our day and age? They go, well, it's raining, it's too far, I had to park too far away. I don't like the priest. He's mean. <laughs> it's, you're coming for Jesus, not whether I'm mean or not. Um, you know, I, I, I told this story many times. I, actually, I don't like going to those major sporting events. It's just so much work. So, so I had lovely, beautiful, wonderful parishioners. Uh, they had season tickets to the Packer games, which you are on a waiting list for like 30 years, and I'm not exaggerating. Um, you, you, you inherit them. And, and only when somebody is no longer being able to inherit, they finally give these tickets back. And if you're next on the waiting list of 30 years, you get the tickets. Um, so, it, they, so they drove me up to a Packer game. I think it was on a Sunday. So I've already worked pretty hard. <laughs> and, so you leave, and it's like a two-and-a-half-hour drive. I think three, because there's a lot of traffic as you get close. Then you have to park far away. Then you have to walk quite the distance. And then you still have to climb up to the nosebleed section. And, and it's cold. It's, it's not nicely climate controlled like the inside of my church. <laughs> uh, the, the burgers and hot dogs are like very expensive. So you're spending money. You had to pay for parking too. Um, then, and you're all happy when it goes overtime, right? Just try to let my homily get a little long. <laughs> like, I'm just moving into overtime here, folks. <laughs> then the game gets done, and then you still have to walk back all that way to your car through the matting crowd, and there's tons of people all trying to get out. At the same time, you get to your car, you still have to get out of the parking lot, then you still have to drive several hours home. It's at least a 10-hour event and, and probably $500 minimum. And yet people can't seem to make their way to Mass where Jesus is present. Where's, where's our, our values? Our, what do we think is really important? It's very easy to see. Well, anyway, back to vote with your... This is where I'm going to get the bishops mad now. Vote with your, your feet in your pocketbook. Go to that priest that will feed you, that loves you enough, that loves you enough to feed you. And, uh, and then... Get, get a piece of paper like this, so it's you know, eight and a half by 11, and then get in great big red block letters that fill up the four, whole page, four words, not one more penny. Sign your name at the bottom, send it into the chanceries, and tell them. Well, I'm just answering. There has to be a national movement. Not one more penny. Not one, because we've had it with you. But you can fix it all. You can, we're very forgiving people. You can fix it all, Bishop, if you just get down on your knees and apologizing, and apologize for abandoning us. Until then, not one more penny. There's the arrogance. I can't tell you the number of places. Well, people really want to give money to the church. So we're going to raise money now. Are you kidding me? You abandon us and you're asking for money. Are you kidding me? What kind of arrogance is in these people? Not one more penny. Just four big red <laughs> words. And send it in. Sign your name. Have, you know, if you get 20 million of those letters into the chancery, maybe they'll figure it out that we have had enough. And enough is enough. Um, there was something else I was going to say. Well, okay. Is that, is that, Kyle, where, is that enough time? I, I was supposed to, I told you, I left the darn thing at home. And uh, do you want more time? 
Oh, I'm done. Oh, okay. Overtime. Overtime. Yeah, overtime. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Kyle is going to ask a bunch of cool questions. So I don't want to take into, get into that time. And, and we've got comfortable seats up here, too. And I'd love to sit down. Um, here's, maybe I could just end with this. A, a lot of these priests that you see on that program are being abused just because they're faithful. They're being abused just because they think they don't want to commit sacrilege with the Holy Eucharist. That they're trying to have incense at Holy Mass. Do you know there's in Exodus 25 to 31, you should all read Exodus 25 to 31 if you haven't yet, because Almighty God commanded us 3,400 years ago how he wants us to worship him through our five senses, which includes smell and sight, which includes incense. Um, in Exodus 25 to 31, if you don't use incense, it says, and the priest should die. And there's something, there's two things. If he's not wearing proper vestments, how many times have you been in the church in the last 50 years and you saw a disgusting clothing up there on the altar? You the priest should die. And then in Leviticus, there's another thing. I can't remember what it is. But there's three instances in the Old Testament where a priest should die if they don't do liturgy right. And you know what it's like because 25 through 31 in Exodus tells us how God commanded us to have sacred liturgy. So it's not like we're, it's not in guesswork. And here's the thing. People say, oh, that's just Old Testament stuff. Wait just a second here. That was the exact same liturgy that happened when Jesus walked on this planet and he did not change a thing. He went to the temple where that liturgy was taking place and he did not change a thing. So don't tell me, modernist Bernadine and your, your spawn, that we need felt, felt banners. Oh Lord, how many people remember the felt banners? There was a time. I think they're mostly gone now. Um, priests are being persecuted just because they're trying to speak the truth, which is, yeah, so I was talking at my table. I'll give, this will be the last thing then. Is that okay? So, um, and I had to explain this to my own bishop. He should be happy that the time's up because if I started going on about what I'd like to. Um, so, uh, true story in law school, we read the case. Uh, all about trying to heal people, to make people whole when they suffered loss. Tort loss, tort law is about personal injury. And there's a case where, um, you know, the highway department is supposed to put lines on the road so you can, you can see where you're going, which is particularly important at night, especially in stormy weather. And they had, through their negligence, had let them fade. So a young man was driving home. It was at night. It was storm, dark and stormy night. He couldn't see where the lines were because they'd faded. He went off the road, hit a tree, died. So the parents sued the highway department. Uh, and they won because it was negligence. It's really hard to win against the government. There's a rule that you can't sue the government. You have to ask permission to sue them. How often do you suppose that's granted? Not often. Anyway, they won. So what I tried to explain to my bishop is, okay, people think I'm, I speak vigorously. I'm painting the lines because then you can choose whether to stay inside them or not. But if they're faded and you know, lose, lose their brightness, their sharpness over time, how are you going to know to not go off the road. And isn't that exactly what has happened? I'm not exactly sure where that analogy came from, that little parable. Well, it came from life's experiences. God has brought me to this point, I guess. And when I, when I mentioned this to my bishop, he did not have a response because there is no response. If you fail to paint the lines up, so this is what I heard. Um, well, that the bishops have failed over the last 50 years to teach people right and wrong. So why are you complaining about me for then? I'm just painting the lines. So, yeah. yeah. Keep painting. All right, well, uh, God bless you all. Um, there's so many things we could talk about. We could be here all night, but I think Kyle's going to ask a lot of questions because he's a good guy to ask questions, and, uh, and that's what we'll do now. Kyle, if you'd come forward again. There's a superstar right here. Did you, did you have a particular side you wanted? Oh, I put my notebook underneath the pillow on that chair. Okay, all right, there but, you go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
it went really loud. So I Are we on here? You, you seem to Mic check? You All right, excellent. Yes. Yes. Well, Okay. This is just like what we do normally with you and I sitting in some chairs with a camera. We just yes. have a couple hundred people <laughs> between us and the camera. So that's yes. very good. Yes. Um, we have a lot to cover. We have some audience questions that I want to get into. I want to talk about the USCCB, this whole calamity with Joe Biden, just because it's in the news yeah. so much and the, the yeah. abortionists. And then I want to talk about, uh, maybe we'll do this first, how you currently stand with relation to the church. Uh, yeah. You alluded to that things might accelerate or change in a week. We know that you've yeah. been asked to step down. You're boldly resisting that. Give us the update. Yeah. So, so whatever day it was, it was, has everybody seen the picture of the rainbow and the dove above my head? Yeah. So if I, if I ever had any doubts, um, what you do, because you, you think, well, these people like me, or they think I'm teaching the truth. These people hate me, think I'm an idiot. And so that day, you, you probably haven't heard this part of the story. So, I, um, this, so that was Sunday. It was Pentecost Sunday. On, on Saturday, I got up at 6 a.m., had my 8 a.m. mass. Then I had two and a half hours of confessions. And then I had another mass in the extraordinary form for Providence's graduation, so I had to come up with a second homily for that. And I got done with that, and then it was time now to prepare for the third mass of the day, which was at 4.30, so I had a third homily, third completely different homily. And then after that, then I had a baptism in the extraordinary form. So it was like a 14-hour day, and I was pretty wiped out, and I get go, so I go right to bed, get up Sunday morning now, and it's, it's 6, got the 7.30 mass, the 9.30 mass, the 11.30 mass, and then after that, the if there's questions and people like to talk, and I, I'm thrilled to do so if I have any energy left. And uh, then I had to go 30 miles to the east because Monsignor Hunt was having his 60th ordination anniversary. Now, I'm not skipping that. So I go there. I get back. It's, it's about 5.30. So keep in mind, this is Sunday, 5.30. After I've had Saturday, and so, so I, I tell my dad and my mom, I, I need to go take a nap. So, so I did. I went upstairs. I laid down and just, you know, nicely getting to doze. And then my dad comes in. He said, hey, there's people out there praying. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. <laughs> so, so I said, okay. So I got up. I got dressed. I put on my black pants. I had a white polo shirt. Somebody, you know, somebody said, well, why wasn't he in his clerics? I was sleeping. <laughs> so, so so I got dressed, and something inspired me. This, I don't know where this, it just came. Go up on the roof and bless them. So there's this, like a flat, it's a flat roof, and there's this lid thing that you climb up this pole ladder thing. You go up there, and um, so I went up there, and, and, and I've got vertigo. So if I walk over, it's not that high. It's two stories, but I walk over the edge, and I start getting a little, like, tipsy. Uh, but I got as close as I could, and they saw me. Oh, look, Father. <laughs> Is it a ghost? No. Um, <laughs> so I raised my hands like Moses. So I, you know the story from Moses when Aaron and her have to raise his hands when he gets tired and Joshua finally wins the battle. So I raised my hands like Moses as you do. And it gets a pretty, you know, you do it at mass. It, I do it in the confessional. Even when people can't see on the other side of the screen, I raise my hands because that's how you bring call down power from on high when you raise your hands. That's what a priest's ordination does for you. So, um, so I did, I raised my hands like that, and I, 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 at some point, I, they were starting to come down, and, at that, and, and somebody go, look. So I turn, and you can see there's a massive rainbow. It was about 7 p.m. at night, and one of the pictures shows just that rainbow's perfectly over my head, and here comes this dove flying right over my head. On Pentecost. So the, the bishops might not like to hear it, but, you know, sign from God. What can, I, can I tell you one more story? Yeah, of course, okay, by all means. All right. So, oh goodness. So I was, uh, you know that I told you about that list that I had to write? So I'm, I'm out at IPF in Omaha, and uh, I go to, um, I, was, I, was, I had a car, my, my friend did not, so we were going to the music store, a religious bookstore, and to this, like a Target kind of a store. I don't go to Target, because um, they're weird. And, but I want to get some Scooby Snacks. Does anybody know what Scooby Snacks are? They're like little cinnamon crackers. They're shaped like dog bones for humans. And uh, so I had some, and everybody else wanted some too. So I quickly ran out of Scooby Snacks. I wanted to go get some more. So we go to the first place. We go to the second place. Now we're trying to get to the third place. And I'm going through this residential section. And it's like through houses. And there's a semi in the road ahead of me. And he's, he's, he's not turning 
He's in the left turn lane. He's not turning, and I miss one light. I miss two lights. I get, I'm, not, I'm not a patient driver. I was getting very upset, and then all of a sudden I see this really slow-moving van, kind of beat up, a horrible-looking thing. If it's not one you want as a teenage boy, it'd be kind of embarrassing. So, uh, and I thought, oh, come on, I'm gonna miss the light again. And then all of a sudden I see coming out on this side of the semi, he's not turning, is this really slow moving car. And it turns out, then I see the tow chain. So I, oh Lord. And at this point I realize I'm being thwarted. It only happened once before, I was in Rome, being thwarted in ways unimaginable. And, and I said at that time, I said, there's something really odd going on here beyond my control. Something unusual is going to happen. And sure enough, I'm walking with another centenarian down a lonely street in Rome and, and drives by the motorcade of Pope Benedict who looks up and waves. I was as close <laughs> as I am to you. So I'm in, I'm in Omaha now and I turned to Tom and I said, Tom, this is, there's something way gone crazy here. Something crazy is going to happen today. So we get to the store, and we're going up and down the aisles, and you know how like they narrow at the end, like, like that? So I, I know this because I have to look for my parents in the grocery store. <laughs> Are they down? You know how you do. You go walking fast, looking down this aisle. So anyway, we're walking down the aisle, and at the far end, um, a black woman dressed, uh, heavier set, dressed in this beautiful dress. I can see it was white with like these blue things on it. Dress, she looked like she just came from the beauty shop. I mean, she was dressed to kill. She's walking down, she's looking down the aisle in our direction as she's walking along, looking for, uh, clearly looking for somebody. She, she stops, she backs up, and then she comes down the aisle looking at me. <laughs> looking at me. <laughs> and she starts waving her finger at me. She says, I was out in the car and the Holy Spirit told me to come in here and find you. Now, I knew nobody in Omaha. Told me to come in here and find you and tell you, you're going to preach with the fire of the Holy Spirit. And she kept, she kept saying this. Okay. <laughs> I just want my Scooby snacks and I'll go. <laughs> so, like with, I don't know why God gives us these experiences except maybe to um, make sure that when the going gets tough, you remember these moments um, where God asks you to do something. You know, the, the Jesus Christ Superstar, it was, it was written by a non-Catholic, and he has some sketchy kind of theology in there somewhere, one of which is Jesus in the garden, right, in Gethsemane. Yes. And, and, he, and he, the words are something to the effect of, well, what in the world, why is this happening, God? You know, I've, I've, I've served you three years, it seems like 30, I think is one of the lines, and take me now before I change my mind, he says, right? That's really bad theology. Jesus came for that moment. He's not going to change his mind. But the point is, is that when you have these experiences, they, they kind of, they, they help support you when these moments come, when people really don't like you and they're in power and they try to crush you like a bug. So that, that's how this whole thing got started. He says, what's going to happen? Well, I was asked to resign. And that's a request. It is not a command. And Bill O'Reilly did not get this. I, I wasn't being disobedient by saying, well, no. Your reasons for asking me to resign are insufficient, inadequate, inaccurate, and they're just plain wrong. I was divisive, that was the claim, and ineffective. So you can see how ineffective I am. Um, again, all glory be to God. Um, yeah. And as, and as for divisive, if we're not being divisive, we're not doing our job. Period, the end. Jesus came to divide. And, and, and you just to understand his culture, nobody divided family. That was the worst thing that could happen. That was the problem with the prodigal son, too. He kind of divided himself from the family. Um, so for Jesus to say that to that culture was staggering. Jesus came to divide. And any shepherd who's too afraid to divide isn't doing his job. But, yeah, so anyway, so the, 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 the reasons why he said I should resign are, are fallacious. They're just wrong. So I didn't. And so now what you have to do is you have to provide this response, which is due on the 25th. So do you have time for this is kind of... Yeah, of course, okay. yeah, yeah. All right, so isn't that... He's so nice to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you just keep talking, and then I don't have to come up with another it's question. It's an extremely easy yeah. job. You, 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 you oh, yeah. say a lot, I so, nod, and say talk more. So I, I'm telling this story only so that you appreciate what the other priests are going through, because I'm man enough. I can, I'm, I can defend myself. Um, so 
they gave me three days to go in and look at the file. Well, my canon lawyer was in Rome. So he's, I'm not going in there without him. Uh, he's going to look at it first because they pick on you because you don't know canon law, because you are at their mercy. This, th and this is the way they treated every other priest, right? I, Can I interject yeah. one thing? What happens if you have a priest that isn't legally savvy and doesn't understand that you need someone to represent you through this canon law? Are they just... Yeah. Oh, they're, they're just... I don't know how to say it. Without out of luck. A polite word. Out of luck. There's a polite way to put it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to use kind of a nuts and bolts kind of an <laughs> example. Um, no, that's actually true. And they know it. And the USCCB has their basic playbook about how bishops can get rid of these priests they don't like. And One that's what they do. When you're in seminary, are you educated yeah. about how canon law works? Is there any official... Yeah. You, you have a basic canon law course but it really doesn't teach you about this kind of stuff. And, and they're not telling you. And there's a lot of stuff they don't tell you. Um, so anyway, so my canon lawyer was in, was in Rome. So, so I couldn't go. I'm not going in there first. And then when he could get back was when I had these other pre-planned vacation days. I, I am allowed to take a vacation. Now, now watch. Now, they had been preparing this file for months. They had several different people working on my file. And when I went in there finally, Friday, what's today? Tuesday? Friday? I heard the names of four different people, including a secretary who's putting stuff in my file that they're trying to incriminate or use against me. A secretary. Well, so, uh, so my candler went in for four days. I went, he had to go back to Rome. He's, I think he's coming back today. I went in on Friday and I said, well, I want to see my file. So I'd seen my file back in February, and it was this big, thick, green, legal size file folder thing with all sorts of stuff in it, and that wasn't there. Instead, they had this manila folder with maybe, maybe this thick of stuff that they had cherry-picked from all the stuff they had to put in the file to share with other priests that have to help them with this decision. And this is why we're telling you we want you to resign and why if you don't, we're going to appoint an administrator, basically, is the way it's going to go. So... Um, they, and, and keep in mind, they only gave me like two weeks to get this whole process done, even though they've been using several people, several months, to prepare this, this compilation of their cherry-picked what they want to say. Um, so I go in there, and I see over on the side counter over there, these four big boxes of, I'd seen two before when I was in there, I think it was February, now it's up to four, big boxes of, you know, you get 5,000 sheets of computer um, or um, photocopier paper? full of cards and letters. Now, how am I supposed to go through that? I'm trying to run a parish. I'm trying to feed my, my parish family. Oh, I'm just going to drop everything for two weeks, and I'm going to come try to read through all those things to find some good stuff, instead of having four different people at least going months going through it all to cherry pick. And then uh, right next to it were two. Shout out to LifeSite. You saw John Henry Weston on there, right? So I talked about Michael Voris and the cool stuff at Church Militant. John uh, Henry Weston was there. Uh, he, um, there were uh, two petitions that he had. The first one was, I think, over 75,000 signatures in support of me. And the one that just came out after Pentecost Sunday was over 90,000. So those are sitting over there. They're, they're not in this little cherry-picked little file, are they? So, so, I, so I said, okay, so I have to see what's in there. And the vicar general said, only if you sign a confidentiality agreement. Well, you know, as a lawyer, I can't think of anything more unjust than the prosecutor saying to the defendant, we'll let you look at this, but you can't use it, you know, you can't cross-examine a witness, you can't test the efficacy of, of any particular document written against you, you can't confront your accuser, it is so unjust and so unfair, but unless you know the canon law, unless you know how to defend yourself, unless you have a good canon lawyer, as I do, uh, or the support of so many people who's helped me pay for that guy, he's not cheap. Um, <laughs> you're at their mercy. And so many good priests have been sidelined because these, Michael Voris called them monsters and miters, they, they sideline you and you're defenseless. You don't even know what to do. Um, Father Kalchik is a... Pro oh, go ahead. Well, this almost feels like a leading question at this yep. point, but... <laughs> They have all these people compiling evidence against you. They've clearly yeah. dedicated a lot of resources oh, to tons. this. They're thinking about the timing. They're strategizing. Yeah, right. It seems like the outcome might already be determined. Oh, Do it's you... completely. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it is. So yeah. 
how do you fight back against that? Do you have any faith yeah. that you can use the system in an honest way to get an honest result? Yeah. Um, well, he asked me. <laughs> I did. So I'll say no. Um, so, so what's going to happen now? So I'm supposed to have this answer by Friday. As if, so, oh wait, but you haven't heard the best part. Okay. So, so I want to look then at this little compilation. He says, you know, you can't look at it unless you sign this, this confidentiality agreement. And I said, my canon lawyer, he did sign it just so he could go through the file and look at it. But I need to look. I'm the defendant here. I need to look at it. And he said, I don't have to. There's nothing in canon law that says I have to sign a confidentiality agreement when I want to look at my own file. Are you kidding me? So I said, no. He says, well, then you can't look at the file. So I just had to leave. I haven't yet seen my file because he won't let me look at it. What kind of kangaroo court, what kind of star chamber, what kind of f is this? And it's not just me. And the reason I'm telling you is not because I'm all upset about me or have sympathy. No, this is what's going on with everybody else. And that's why the good priests you see are sidelined or shift off. They, they take, what do they say? They try to send you to. Uh, see, this, they asked me to resign. Here's what happens when you resign. You suddenly lose your canonical canon law protections as a pastor. At which time... They can say, well, I want to send you to St. Luke's for a little indoctrination training. I want you to go be a chaplain at an old folks home way out in Timbuktu where nobody will ever hear from you again, right? As long as you're a pastor, they can't do that because I'm a pastor. And if I appeal this decision, if he appoints an administrator, if I appeal that decision, unless, unless the current bishop of Rome who hates me, I heard there's cardinals over there that hate me. I don't know why. <laughs> unless he kind of fast tracks it which has been known to happen it's maybe a year or something where I'll be a pastor without a parish so to speak I won't be able to work in the parish now he could and he could also he could say well I'm also taking away your faculties but here's the thing um, everybody's going to know now whereas before with all these other priests who have been persecuted Nobody really hears. Nobody knows how to do anything. That day is over, bishops of the United States, because now we're coming back. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so, yeah. cool. so after, after this comes in on Friday late, they probably by Monday, they might issue a letter saying, he said, uh, he said I, I heard this, well, I've disrespected him. Listen, respect is a two-way street. Who disrespected who? You know full well that over 30 times, despite my disagreement with him, I have not said it publicly. For over 30 times in homilies, I have praised him and said he was a superior to all the other bishops who closed their churches and denied people the sacraments. I have praised him. In interview after interview, somehow now there's this idea that somehow I disrespected him. Listen, disrespect is a two-way street. If anybody disrespected anybody, it's you disrespected me. And if any bishop disrespected, if any person disrespected, the bishops disrespected every single one of you when they denied you access to the sacraments. That is disrespect. If you want to talk about disrespect, bishops of the United States, bring it on. I'm right here. Come sit in this chair. Kyle and I will have a heyday with you. That's the interview we need to schedule next. Yeah. So Scott needs to write that down. Anyway, does that, um, I think that answers your question. You might have more questions than I'm yeah, just ranting. Yeah. No, I've, I've got a couple more questions. Okay. This is very interesting insight. Um, you've mentioned a couple times this interview you did with Church Militant where it was yeah. you and some other priests yeah. talking about your encounters with the system. Yeah. If yeah. members of the audience haven't seen that yet, I absolutely recommend they go yeah. do that. It's, it's heartbreaking. I'm, listen, whatever that I'm going through is nothing compared to what these priests have been put through by these miters. But how, how, <laughs> how, many, how many priests do you think have been subjected to this treatment? Because yeah. you're a very public example, but you don't have yeah. to dig that far to find nine more on that panel. Oh, yeah. I mean, how many more would come out if you dug further? Yeah. Well, I heard that minimally there's at least, in, in the Diocese of Rockford alone, there's at least, I think, a dozen, might be as high as 20. Look what they just did to Father Parker. That guy, do you know where he comes from? He was ordained by Rembert Weakland. Do you know who Rembert Weakland is? He was up near here, wasn't he? He was in Collegeville. He had aspirations. They knew he was bad news way back when he was a, a Benedictine monk up in uh, Latrobe. And then he goes to, you know the story, he goes to Milwaukee where he pays his lover $500,000 of church money to keep quiet. And then, of course, when the money runs out, then he, then he doesn't keep quiet anymore, right? That's who was the sponsor, basically, of Malloy in Rockford. You know, apples don't fall far from the trees. 
um, you appoint or elevate or whatever people of a like mind. Um, this has been going on. So, oh, it's so bad in the church. But it, never, here's your, here's your consolation. Never forget this. Jesus is in the boat. It just seems like he's sleeping. He's very much aware, and he will fix it in his time and in his way. And maybe that's what's going on right now. I don't know. <laughs> There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds to answer Kyle's question. Mm -hmm. That's very disturbing, and it's definitely a story that people need to hear more about, and we're very glad that you're, you're, you're spreading the message on that. To pivot a little bit, yeah. um, just because it's in the headlines, I have to ask you, the USCCB, uh, there's been this controversy between them and Joe Biden. It looks like there might be some sort of move in the near future to give ministers the power to say, no, you know, we're not going to provide the Eucharist to abortionists. How likely do you think it is that this is actually going to succeed with current church leadership? It's zero. Mm. Well, I, you asked. Yeah, I, I All did. All right, so let's see. Can I ask? I'm just going to ask a couple people. Where are you from? Vermont. Yeah. From, from Minneapolis? From, um, okay, so two plus two is what? Four. Okay, where are you from? Yeah. Okay. Can, so who's not from here? Okay. okay. Where, where are you from? Seattle. Yeah. Of course, Seattle is pretty crazy. This is almost a loaded question. Two. <laughs> it's been in the news. Two plus two is what in Seattle? Four. Right? Anybody else from some other? <laughs> yeah. That's very racist to say it's four. I, I've heard. <laughs> the point is this. Where are you from? Texas? Yes. Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico. Is, what, in Puerto Rico, two plus two is? Four. Exactly. Truth is truth wherever it is, right? Okay, so here's the deal. If it's sacrilege to, take, to give Holy Communion to a pro abort politician in Seattle, in Puerto Rico, or <laughs> that place he talked about, <laughs> um, then it's also sacrilege to do so in Washington, D.C., Wilton Gregory. It's sacrilege to do it in Chicago. What's his name down there? Blaze Supich. How could I forget that one? He's, I can tell you this, he hasn't forgotten me. He's, he, he wrote a letter to my bishop. Robert McElroy in San Diego, two plus two is four. It's sacrilege to give Holy Communion to a pro abort politician, period, the end. And we've had Cardinal Lorenzo, we had Cardinal Ratzinger, the Pope Benedict XVI made it crystal clear. And anybody who says any differently than that is a liar and a, and a diabolical presence in the Catholic Church. Get out. So, but, but they're there, aren't they? And some of them are wearing red hats. I like the color red, but not the way they do. So, yeah. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, well, okay, this, yeah, dovetails, moving on. this dovetails very nicely with another yeah. question we have, and I think you touched on this during your talk earlier. Somebody asks, uh, when and how is it appropriate to question or challenge what is being put forth? You mentioned voting with your feet and voting with your pocketbook. Uh, are there any other ways that people could communicate to these higher church leaders, perhaps the ones who wear red hats, yeah. that uh, we feel very strongly about these issues? Yeah. I'm not sure. Well, listen, I, I've had a hard time trying to read my mail, just mine. And, and a lot of that has been sent to my own bishop. And I'm sure other people send him other mail on other, some other things. And I, he, there, he does not have time to sit and read it all. Um, if it's four big red-lettered words, that'd make it easy read. Um, maybe put one of those stamps on the outside of it. The return envelope, the return thing, put that... Get those, yeah, get those little labels, return labels, yeah. not one more penny. Um, here's the thing I said before, respect is a two-way street. Every single shepherd of the church that denied access to the sacraments of grace to you does not deserve respect. It is not being disrespectful to call them out on their disrespecting you. They're the ones that threw the first punch. They're the ones that disrespected you, and you have an absolute right as a baptized Catholic to demand access to the sacraments, period. So, so it's not being disrespectful to let them know and tune them in, not one more penny. Um, so whether they listen or not, uh, yeah, it's another yeah. story. Th yeah, does that answer that question? Yeah, it does. Okay, it does. Right. I think you know, okay. that seems like a very effective yeah. method. Um, 
I don't want to say that you've been leading this groundswell. I think you've been giving voice to a, sort of a groundswell opinion that people feel neglected by church leadership, people feel abandoned. Uh, somebody asked a question here uh, about the division in the church between people like you who want to tend the flock and people like we've talked about who don't. Uh, and they're asking, Isn't he diplomatic? People we talked about. <laughs> He's not naming names. Go ahead. Well, you don't know faces. I forget names okay, sometimes. Yeah, but um, <laughs> this person's asking how many people inside the church you estimate would stand with you. And if this were to come to a head and become a more public issue, if uh, there would be a coalition, a large coalition of, of people in the church who feel the way you do. The, the problem is, is the vast majority of Catholics don't even know their faith. Like, like the bishop said to me, 80% don't know right from wrong. So can I expect them, in our culture, which is so don't offend anybody, um, can I expect them to stand up and say anything? I, I did, somebody asked a question in the, during dinner, and I said I'd answer it this way. Um, a prelate once said to me that there's a great aloneness and standing up and speaking out, speaking the truth. Because even your friends that agree with you will not be seen with you in public because then they'll get painted with the same brush and be subject to the same persecution. So there aren't that many who will stand up and say anything. Now, once you have nothing to lose because you've already been kicked out, uh, then you can form the coalition for a, a persecuted priest. You can do, there's I think three movements afoot right now where we're finally going to get together and say, like the three musketeers, all for one and one for all. Mess with one, you mess with all of us. You know, Chicago, the, the Chicago priests once formed a union, because I think it was Cardinal Cody, I don't want to besmirch his name, but I'm, that was what I was told, was such a miserable tyrant and was so abusive to the priests that they formed a, they formed a union. Well, maybe that's what we need to do, is, is form a union of sorts so that they can say, listen, until such time as we're not preaching the truth, Back off, Jack. That's, yeah, I like that phrase. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It seems like a lot of this relies on judging rightly. And um, nowadays, sort of the contemporary narrative is that Christians shouldn't judge, they should only love. And especially as we're in Pride Month right now, we hear this all the time, uh, that there should be no judgment, there should only be love and acceptance. What you just talked about, forming these coalitions, involves a fair amount of judging. Uh, how do you properly judge rightly, and how could somebody who is less educated in the ways of the church, a lay person, also have that same judgment? All right, so this is actually an easy question to answer, and, uh, and, it, and I'll answer it the same way I used to answer it when I was teaching in the, in the high school with juniors and seniors. So I'd pick on some, some big football player, so let's pick on Kyle. Can I pick on Kyle right now? <laughs> so, so I'd be standing next to all the desks, and I'd go up to him, and I'd go, Bang, like that. And I'd get I that didn't flinch. He, di he didn't. Yeah, I'm actually impressed. He didn't know this was coming. This has not been rehearsed. And uh, if I had bloodied his nose, there'd have been no way he would have been crying because you can't help but cry when your nose gets you have blood everywhere. Do you need God's Ten Commandments to know that's just bad behavior on my part? You don't do that, right? We know what's right and wrong. And the first thing you're going to say, Father, you're not supposed to hit him. Right. Why? That's judgment. Because you know right from wrong. It's written into our hearts. Almighty God has written his law into our hearts. So there's no excuse when you get to the gates. Say, oh, I didn't know. No, no, no. That's not going to fly. We are called to judge all the time. We're called to judge where the lines in the road are. Uh, it helps when your pastor paints the lines a little brighter so you can see because you're busy working, trying to make a living for your family, trying to... You listen, if your kid misbehaves when he's a kid, do you not say, hey... Don't touch that hot stove. And then smack his hand because you know, you're know you out of love. Can I tell you one more story? Of course, I, I don't of know. Course. I'm, I'm happy to be here a while, but um, <laughs> I think Overtime. those chairs look pretty comfortable. Uh, <laughs> so when I was, when I was seven, 16, um, I was the only kid in my class that had his driver's license and had access to a car. So we had a two-door old Chrysler Newport. And my parents said, okay, you can take this car because we lived three miles out of town. It was the only way I could get involved in sports and stuff. You can take the car, but you're not allowed to have anybody else in the car because it's distracting. And we're, we love you, and that's what's behind all this, and we don't want you to hurt yourself or hurt somebody else. Well, what do my parents know? <laughs> so one night, just out with the guys, I think, 
I think it was a total of nine in the car. A two-door car. And we got, it was winter time, so we got to the end of this road. We were looking for some people. They were down there parking, and, uh, as you do in high school. And I couldn't turn around because there were cars down there, so I had to back up. Um, I never really have liked the taste of alcohol, so I hadn't been drinking. In my age, it was, the drinking age was 18, so some of the p kids in the car were 18. They were, they were legally drinking. We weren't breaking the law there. But. So they're hanging out the, the passenger side door. It catches on the snowbank and practically rips it off. <laughs> so, so now what? Like, how did the, If it was my side, I could have I lied. I could have said, well, I was you know, trying to back up. And, how do I explain the passenger door when there's not supposed to be any passengers? I ended up with a one-door car, and it's a lot of stories there. But um, my parents judged that it wasn't a good idea out of love to not have, let me have people in the car. I didn't trust them, didn't believe them, and I paid the price for this. So um, it is perfectly okay to judge. We are supposed to judge. And in fact, it is sinful on your part if you do not judge. You have a duty and a responsibility. In fact, if you ask me, if you give me your email, I'll send it to you. I have six pages of sacred scripture all talking about our duty to judge and to warn others. Like Ezekiel where it says, listen, I've appointed you watchtower or I've appointed you parent over your children. You better tell your kids if they don't miss, if they, because if they misbehave, they're going to, they're going to be responsible for their own misbehavior. But I'm going to hold you responsible for their misbehavior because you didn't tell them, you didn't warn them, you didn't judge their behavior as bad, right? We have a duty to do that from sacred scripture, from God Almighty. So um, this, oh, this whole, oh, don't judge, you're sounding so judgmental. Oh, baloney. That's from somebody who doesn't, who's feeling guilty because you actually speak the truth. That, that, I think that well, answers that. It is a very interesting point that people only have this proclivity to not judge when they seem to know what they're doing is wrong. You only hear about this in the context of discussions of overtly sinful activities. Yeah, so, yeah that's, a, that's actually a good point. So I'll use an example. So um, who haven't I picked on yet? <laughs> so let's say I'm with him and, and he punches Kyle. And I say to him, hey, quit punching Kyle. That's really bad behavior. Is he going to say, quit judging, or is he going to say, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry, Kyle. I'll pay for the nose job. <laughs> <laughs> People, when you, um, when you actually confront somebody that knows they've done wrong uh, and have faith and understanding about it, that they will, they will, they will be convicted in a, in a good way. The people that are know they're doing wrong and don't want to be convicted are the ones that are going to say, do not judge. So whenever you hear somebody say, do not judge, you got to wonder what they're thinking as to trying to, well, uh, the, the poet said the greatest sin in the last century is uh, the loss of the sense of sin. The great sin of James Martin and his ilk is that they're trying to redefine sin as not sin. I mean, for 4,000 years, it's been sin. Everywhere, anywhere and everywhere. Now James Martin is trying to normalize it. It doesn't mean you don't love everybody. And it doesn't mean that the same sins against the Sixth Commandment don't apply to everybody else. You know, I, it's, a, it's the Sixth Commandment applies to all of us, myself included. So um, uh, we don't redefine sin as not sin. So we don't say, well, they're my kid and they're cohabiting, but okay, they're nice kids. God will let them go to heaven. Well, I don't know. If they get hit by a bus, there might be a problem because we know for a fact that's not proper behavior. If we love them, why aren't we telling him? You know Penn and Teller? Have you heard me talk about Penn and Teller? Penn Gillette, right? He says, if you, I don't have any respect for anybody that, does it, that thinks I might go to hell if I keep... <laughs> that's what I used to say when I... We'd say, where are you going? I'm going to hell if I don't change my ways. We would, if, if, if you th actually think somebody could go to hell for not changing their ways, and you don't tell them, how much do you have to hate them? That was his question. He says, I have respect for a Christian who will proselytize me, but I have no respect for a Christian who won't say anything. How much did they have to hate me to not tell me I'm going to hell? If they actually believed it. How many, how many of you actually believe you can go to hell? Look, go ahead. Yeah, that's, it's good to see unanimity amongst Catholics. <laughs> yes, we can. I might be the first one. I might greet you. Well, I hope I don't greet you at the door. For my sake and yours. Um, but when you have people saying uh, such things as, well, Jesus is just a privileged way, or you have somebody say something like, dare we hope that there aren't anybody, there's very few people in hell. Well, then our Blessed Mother, sh I should have a talk with her. 
because she showed those three precious children what hell looked like. So Fatima. So don't tell me, shepherd of the church, that there is no hell and a lot of people don't go there. Jesus said many and only few will choose. I just was reading it today. Only a few are going to choose heaven. Many will choose hell. Well, I, you know, if, how are you going to choose if I don't paint the lines for you? How are you going to choose if the church, if the bishops of the church don't teach you right from wrong, but instead, like Stowe down there in Lexington, is normalizing and promoting sin. What, there, how, there's four sins, right, that cry out to heaven for vengeance. Do you know this? Four. One's killing, so that's abortion. One is... I think mistreating widows and orphans. One is, yeah, that's a, yeah. There is another word for it. I was trying to come up with a polite word. Um, that's one of them. Uh, and then I forget what the fourth one is, but I think somebody was saying it. Wages. It's the wages yeah. one. Thank you. Boy, we've got Catholics in this room. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was struggling. Um, so yeah. So Bishop Stowe, don't normalize something that cries out to God from for vengeance. And, and Joe Biden, don't pretend you're Catholic, Nancy Pelosi, when you're committing one of the sins that cries out to God to heaven for vengeance. Okay. I really like that response because it touches at two things that I enjoy most about your message. It's this judgment from a position of compassion, and it's not being afraid to talk very candidly about the realities of hell and the realities of evil, which is something that we don't see in the church as often, and especially not in society at large, so I really appreciate that. Um, to circle back a little bit, I want to get to another audience oh, Do you know what that here. sounds like? I know. I know. As soon as I said it, yeah, I knew I, I was going to get hit. As soon as I said it. But um, okay. somebody asks, if you are removed from your parish, uh, where will we hear your words to help guide your worldwide flock? Yeah. You, know, you know what's amazing? And this seems to be lost on the critics. Mm -hmm. that if I wasn't speaking the truth, nobody would be listening to me for two seconds. I said that to Bishop himself. Um, why is it? In fact, so if, there's this funny meme. It goes, uh, if you're relying on me to be the voice of reason, we're all in trouble. Yeah. And so <laughs> it, if I wasn't speaking, if why, this is how I mean it, why, why is anyone from anywhere outside of St. James Parish listening to a single word I say? Who's not saying it out there? And what I have heard from the entire globe, I just got this past week, we got letters from New Zealand and I think Scotland and I think Australia. Why are people writing me from all over the globe saying, we're not hearing the truth? Why is anybody listening to me? I, I don't listen to me. So I, <laughs> it has to be that nobody else is painting the lines. And yet we know the lines are supposed to be there. In fact, as humans who love, as humans that seek salvation, that, that are striving to, to, to go along the narrow road, we're begging these shepherds to paint the lines to help us out. That's their job. So, so um, I mean, maybe it's premature, but after tonight, maybe not. I think I'll probably be, I have a little extra time on my hands come July 1. And uh, that's the date that all the priests get transferred to most dioceses, I think, and so, so too in ours. And I think they want to make a move at that particular point. I'm just speculating. But why wouldn't I, when I'm confronted with what I'm confronted with on Friday? Um, the, so I just was gifted a very, very nice apple, something. It's like, squ it's like it's square, One of the very computers. thin. It's not a computer. iPad. It's, is that it's an iPad? I've I've never had Apple before, so is that what it's called? So I think so. Okay, I think that's what you're talking and about. it's like a, she she called it a Cadillac, so it's gonna. But the purpose of it was so that I can now live stream again. Uh, so if I am suddenly independentized, <laughs> I just made up that word. Uh, I'm a priest forever, and just dare you. Any bishop try to take away my faculties. Just dare you. You didn't take the faculties away from child molesters. And you covered up for other bishops. And you dare say you're going to take away my faculties. Just you try, bishop. Yeah. <laughs> it's Kyle's fault. He asked the question. 
I often, I, I often get asked that question before I speak to people. That anything you don't want to talk about, anything you don't want me to ask, you say, well, you know, if there's a question in your mind, it's a fair game. And, and if I can't, if I'm not man enough to answer your question, maybe I should turn in my collar. Um, yeah, I know people, some, there, are, <laughs> there are haters. I, I, we just got one today. My, my mother, she's, she's going to be 90 in August. So she o was opening the mail as I'm trying to finish the talk that I didn't bring in the end anyway. Um, and she said, there wasn't that much today. Uh, she said, there's one really nice one. There's one really, really bad one, just awful. Don't, you don't have to read it, Jim. You know, I've often found that, that those nasty ones don't have return addresses because they're cowards. Yeah, so I don't know. I, I don't know what it is, but um, I why did I sit, start talking about that? I forgot. Oh, we're talking about uh, what might become of your platform. Oh, if yeah, wars okay. Comes to pass. So there'll be haters, but, um, you know, if, if I'm your father, I don't care whether you're in, the, did it begin with the letter S? Shoreview. Yes, I was right. And we've got Puerto Rico and Texas back there and Seattle. Seattle. <laughs> if, if I can feed you, why wouldn't I? What kind of father would I be? What, what would they, yeah, what kind of father would I be if I didn't feed you? It, but, but, oh, it was in that vortex, too. I did call out the Archbishop of Seattle. Because he's, it doesn't, he's one that's also saying, get the injection and um, listen I'll say it I've said it before I'll say it again if it worked nobody has a complaint against you for not getting it because it, say, if, if it works if it doesn't work why are you putting it inside you yeah. you know absolutely unfortunately father we're coming down in our time here so I just want to round this off with with two more very quick questions um, the first is, what prayer helps you, uh, helps remind you the most that the real enemy is Satan and embolden you in your fight? Well, the, the St. Michael prayer, as I said, we say it after every Mass. Um, it's wh I mean, I specifically put him above my right shoulder when I'm preaching because I do want him to protect. Do we believe he can protect us? Otherwise, are we just pretending? Do we believe the tenets of our faith, that the holy angels, by the way, they outnumber the bad angels two to one, right? Have you ever heard me talk about how many, how many bad angels there are? 50 billion? And I come up with that number. Scientists have believed now that when they look at the population curve that there's a, been 100 billion, it's now I think up to 107, I'll just use 100 because it's easier math. There's 100 billion people have lived on the planet since the beginning of time. And we know that God created all the angels in advance and that each angel is unique. And each, your guardian angel is unique to you. So if I get hit by a bus on the way home, that God doesn't say, oh, I've got, oh, good, because there's another baby being born. I'm going to take you and reassign you. Repurpose, isn't that the word we use these days? <laughs> he doesn't repurpose guardian angels. That means there has to be at least 100 billion good guardian angels. But if a third of the angels are swept from grace, that means there's at least 50 billion demons. And everywhere Jesus went, he was driving out demons. One 500 at a time, they went into the swine. No, I used to get troubled by that story, and then somehow I came to understand uh, that, well, it's almost like a baptism, isn't it? Here the, sweet, the swine were possessed, and they went down the cliff and drowned in the water. It was almost like getting rid, they got rid of the, the demons through water, through the washing of the water. That's, there's something beautiful in that reflection. Um, anyway, uh, the prayer, St. Michael prayer, I guess. Our Blessed Mother, the Holy Rosary, yeah, there it is. The, the mysteries of the rosary, uh, God, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help me, which is in the, the beginning every time you start the liturgy, the hours. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then our last question here. Um, what resources are available to people if they would like to assist you in this fight? I know that you mentioned that there's some change petitions. Uh, you mentioned that people should be writing those letters that say not one more cent. Uh, how can people best be of utility to both you and to this broader movement of people that uh, are disturbed by some of the trends we're seeing? The, the, yeah. The, the problem is too big for us to fix. Only Jesus is going to be able to fix this. So um, I have said time and time again, and I'll say it again, uh, build your temporal arcs because we're supposed to be prudent with those things that God has given us. 
I have got so many hideaways around this country now. Because just tonight, somebody said, I think it's in Brainerd. Come up to Brainerd. You can hide out there. Um, you know, I don't even know where that is on a map. But I assume it's not too Nobody far away from Nobody will find you there. Yeah. Well, there you go. Um, build your temporal arcs. And be prepared for the disasters that's going to come. There's this book called uh, Nine Meals to, Anar to Anarchy, I think it is. So that's three days. You saw it doesn't take but one, like, something crazy to happen, and suddenly Minneapolis is on fire again. Seattle, Portland, uh, Chicago. Uh, that, that, could, what, if, if we are not recognizing the signs of the times for what they are and how close we are to the night, here's, okay, here, just take this to the bank. Rwanda. They're living, 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 living. The president's plane goes down. They, that's the catalyst. So it's a concept of there's a critical mass building up, and all it takes is one catalyst, which is making it explode. In one day, they started macheteing, which is a very personal way of killing. It's, and, and within 90 days, I think it was a million people were dead. We are fools living in fool's paradise. If we do not understand with the fomenting of racism in this country, fa false racism, the, the way that Obama started creating this victim and that victim, and everybody's a victim, 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 and suddenly we have to have reparations for something, you know, pretty near 200 years ago. Um, there, there is such a fomenting of antipathy between, divi division between peoples. Um, even something so simple as, let's make America great again. How can you not want to make America great again? That makes no sense. So what's happened now is that there is this division that has been created intentionally, and, and all it's going to take is the right catalyst. And if you don't have your temporal arcs prepared by then, you're going to kind of lose out. Um, the other thing is your spiritual arcs, because don't worry about who can kill the body. In the end, uh, if God has a purpose and plan for you, all things work to the good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's Romans 8 something. Um, come what may, you know, uh, if I, if I get hit by a bus on the way home tonight, well, I hope God that I served you tonight. Um, build your spiritual arcs and you see that is more important than any temporal arc ever could be. That is eternally important. And that is exactly why every bishop that denied you, your sacramental, the grace of the sacraments denied you the opportunity to build your spiritual arc, better get down on his knees publicly and beg your forgiveness. And do it before it's too late. Yeah. Is that well, Father, we've, we've certainly covered a lot of ground tonight uh, in your address and in the questions we just answered. There's much more ground that we could cover, but I don't think the people here would be here till 2 in the morning. Uh, what time is it? I don't even know. It's, it's not dark yet, but it is like the longest day of the year, second this longest. true. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we've covered a lot of ground tonight. We've talked about a lot of meaningful topics. You've given some daunting warnings. Um, I was wondering if you could lead us in a prayer to sort of close and help reinforce uh, the spirits of everyone okay. gathered here today. All right. Well, why don't we, uh, the Memorare is, is a good prayer. I mean, we do ask our Blessed Mother who loves us, loves her faithful children. So let us call for her intercession in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy, hear and answer me. Amen. St. Thomas More and St. Bishop St. John Fisher. St. Tarsisius, Defender of the Holy Eucharist unto Martyrdom. St. Joseph, Guardian of the Holy Eucharist. Our Lady, Queen of Heaven, Mother of the Holy Eucharist. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you all. Uh, yeah. Hey, you're here. <laughs> Life Sight News. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. Can I just say that LifeSite News is present and accounted for in person? How cool is that? So you can tell John Henry I said good things about him. <laughs>
All right. Good night, everybody. Safe travels home. Holy Angels Garden guide you. One very final thing. Oh. One very final thing. I know we're yeah. distributing some copies of your book. Okay. Um, could you tell people about the book? And I'm, I stand they can acquire a copy back there somewhere. Okay. Um, I, I think I'm going to be over there signing some books if somebody wants a signature of, of me, unworthy servant. Um, so uh, just please tell me your name, even if you've told me it before. <laughs> and, uh, uh, or a dedication. Judge Jeannie per, 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 mm -hmm. Judge Jeanine. Uh, wrote one to my mother and father when I was down in Sar in Atlanta. Um, yeah, just I'll sign them over there. I think there's some available for purchase, and and I will sign them for you. Absolutely. Well, hey, thank you very much, everybody, for coming out. Thank you, right. Father Altman. All right. God bless. Good Have night, everyone. Night.